Amen. Good to have everybody here this morning. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. Could we all please stand as we do our morning pledges? When we're ready, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make of a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart, that I might not sin against God. To our Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again. To the American flag, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, may I have the choir up here, please? I don't see the little one, so we'll have the choir.
choir comes down. Let's everybody stand in fellowship, please. All right. Amen. We've done a lot to pray for this morning, folks. Anybody have a special prayer request upon their heart this morning? Amen. Let's remember Sister Dolores and remember Hazel this morning. Anybody have a special prayer request? Amen. Let's remember Michelle. Amen. Let's remember Mitch this morning. Also, let's remember Bruce and, and Hunter. Let's remember them this morning. Sister Joyce, glad to have you with us again this morning. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Let's certainly remember that. Amen. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Let's remember Sister Marie and her family. Anyone else? Amen. Remember Donna Helton. Anyone else, please? All right, those that have an unspoken prayer request, all that will, let's all come into the altar, please.
Amen. May I have the men up for the morning offering, please? Brother Brian. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for another day. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, for the service today. I pray, Lord, that your word be spoken. And, and just to impress on everybody's heart, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you just have it to reach out to the one, Lord, that may be lost. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. And we thank you for all that you do and all that you've done. We love you and honor you. And for all these things I ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 We've got a few announcements to make. Don't forget, uh, coming up on April the 15th, uh, we're going to have the, the closed giveaway. Uh, I believe the time is usually 8 to 3, I believe it is. So uh, everybody that participates in that, be there for that. Also, don't forget, uh, play practice tonight at 4.30. 4.30. Also, on all, uh, April the 5th, and then also April the 12th. Don't forget those. Uh, the, the time on the Easter egg hunt, I believe, has been changed from 2 to 6. Is that correct? 3 to 6? Okay. 3 to 6. Okay. It's been changed again. <laughs> All right. And also, that's on April the 8th for the Easter egg hunt, 3 to 6. April the 9th, we'll be having our early morning sunrise service from 6 a.m., and also, the Easter play will be followed the following week on the 16th during our evening service. All right. Do we have anybody that has any special songs that they would like to sing this morning? Oh, we, oh here we go. I was about to say we didn't have no volunteers. All right. The Father has a plan, though it's hard to see it now. You feel you're walking all alone, but he is there, no doubt. When the storm around you rages, and you're tossing to and fro, when you're faced with life's decisions, not sure which way to go, stand still and let God move, standing still. It's hard to do when you feel you have reached the end. He'll make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. When your enemy surrounds you and the ways are closing in, when the tide is swiftly rising and you wonder where he's been, friend, there never was a moment that his arms were reaching out. You can rest and sure and be secure. God is moving right now. So stand still and let God move. Standing still is hard to do. When you feel you have reached the end, he'll make a way for you. Stand still and let God move. Stand still and let God move. Amen. I'm so thankful that we've got young people that will stand up here and sing for the Lord. Praise God for you. Anyone else, please? Sister Joyce, do you have a song this morning? Well, Debbie, I guess we resort to you. 
<laughs> uh, anyone else? Brother Bobby, I guess we're going to, we're calling on you to pull us through, brother. <laughs> Amen. I figured y'all got it worked up that if you get me started early, you won't have to stay late. <laughs> Amen. If you notice, there have been a, two or three different announcements this morning. The clothing giveaway, the key word to that is giveaway. We're going we're gonna to name that Adopt an Outfit. If we want you to take everything, the theme is going to be Everything Must Go. Amen. Amen. Are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. And I'll tell you what, the older I get, I'm just glad to be anywhere, but I'm especially glad to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. All right, then. How about the book of Psalms, chapter number 122? If that suits everybody, when you find 122 in the Psalms, just stand to your feet. Verse number 1. And the Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father God, as we bow before you, thanking you so much for the gift of this day, for each and every one that's came out, for the songs that were sang. God, for your church family that has assembled this morning in this church. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do this morning. Lord, we ask for the power of God upon this message, the words to say, clarity of thought, wisdom, and discernment of the word. Search our hearts here this day, God, that any amongst us that's never been saved, that this will be the day that they invite the Lord Jesus into their heart. It's so easy and simple, but God, it is the greatest decision that we'll ever make. We ask, God, that your presence would be in this church for the remainder of this, that you would bless those who are not here, bless every preacher that stands in the pulpit to break the bread of life. God, pray that your will would be done in every church, and we'll be careful to give you praise, honor, and glory for it all. In Christ Jesus' name we did pray, and amen. Do you notice in that one verse it said, I was glad? Do you realize that every person, every family, every group, everybody that makes up a church family is made up of individuals called I? Everything about what you get out of a church service starts with you. Your relationship with Christ started with you accepting him as your, as your, your personal Savior. And it's a collective I's in the church that makes up a we. And the, the message that, that David the psalmist is saying, I was, I was glad, which means I've done settled in my heart when it comes to God's house and spending time with God and going to God's, God's place. He said, I'm glad of that. Amen. It's something that should bring joy to every born-again Christian. It's not a, this is not a have-to on Sunday. It's not drudgery. This is you get to go to God's house. And if you'll go back in your mind and your memory back when we had COVID and you couldn't come into God's house, how glad were we when we came in? You realize, you don't realize what something means to you until it's gone from you. Whether it be God's house, God's presence, God's power, whether it be somebody that you love dearly. And what I'm trying to tell you this morning as I get the introduction ready for the message is don't wait until it's too late to be glad about something you should be glad about now. Amen. He said, I was glad. Now, don't you to understand, this is David. They didn't have the New Testament church. They didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ like we, like we have him now as our Lord and Savior. But they, they, what they did have no testament. He said, let me tell you everything in my life that ought to be glad about. The one thing I want to mention that I am glad about every time is the fact is I was glad when they said, let's come into the house of the Lord. This ought to bring more joy and a smile and anticipation to you than anything else in your life is coming into God's house. Because I want to preach here for just a little bit about some of the things by way of introduction that God offers us. You know what the word glad even means? That means to cause joy. 
That don't mean joy just shows up. That don't mean that don't mean joy is something that you might get, you might not. It's the cause of your joy is going to God's house. David said, "Let me tell you something." He said, "I know that I am king. I know of all of Israel. I know that I'm a warrior. I'm a giant killer. I've done a lot of great feats and I've done a lot of accomplishments. I had uh, numerous victories in my life, but the one thing that consistently makes me glad every time." that it comes time is it's going to God's house. Let me tell you something, church. If you ever get to the place where you physically cannot be in God's house anymore, you'll give just about everything you can just to be here. This is an honor and a privilege to go into God's house. And David said, above all things in my life that made me glad, I'm talking about the king of Israel. I'm talking about the man that is a, that when he was a boy killed a nine and a half foot giant. He's a great warrior. He's had more victories on the battlefield than any other man in all of Israel. But yet what makes him glad is going to God's house. Amen. There's a lot here if you'll just get in on it. Amen. You got to sign up for it. That simply means once you're saved, you are entitled to everything God has to offer. It's not for a few. It's not for just some. It's not for the, the chosen. It is for everybody that has been saved and now calls Jesus their Savior. Let me get to just a few things right here. He said that I, that was me. Can you honestly say this morning that you're glad to be in God's house? Now, it's not based on what might happen. It's based on that every time I go into God's house, I know something is going to happen because God is in God's house. That's what's going to make me glad. I don't prescribe nothing. I don't pre plan out nothing, but I just say, God, just ever how you want it done, just go ahead and show up. That's the, we've done the part. We've showed up. We're here. And I know God has got something for everybody in this church this morning. He said, I was glad. That means rejoice in the thy. That's what he's saying to other believers. They're just here with us. They're just here helping us. But it's up to you and it's up to me as individual believers to get something something out of being in God's house. I know maybe as a young and they may not be mature enough to understand what all God does have to offer. But thank God they get something too, do they not? You've got the littlest one to the oldest one in this church and God's got something for all of us. And David said, I may not know what God's going to do, but I know when I get there, God is going to do something. Number one, let me say that, well, in order to get to God's house, and I bring this as remembrance to the time that we went through COVID, and the government said we can't come in, just lock the doors, and Fauci and that, br that bunch of communists said, uh, it's the most dangerous place that you're ever going to be, and all the while, God's sitting on His throne, He's saying, I didn't shut the door, I didn't say you couldn't come in. I didn't say I couldn't bless during COVID. I ain't changed a thing about me. I'm still the same great God I've always been. I ain't withheld my blessings. I'll still create miracles. I'll still heal the sick. I'll still save the lost. It's still my house. I'm still the same great God I always was. Don't you ever let somebody tell you you cannot come into God's house and worship Him. Amen. What I'm trying to tell you, if we learn nothing else from going through that mess of COVID, is that God's church will not bow. We will not bend to anybody that says you can't come into God's house and worship. As they say, they snookered one over on us. They got everybody to believe church was a death trap. All the while, God's saying, I'll give you life and give it to you more abundantly. All God is saying, I'm on the throne. It's Sunday morning. Where's my people at? My house is empty. And all the while, you never miss church so much to the point as you missed it when somebody says you can't be here. Don't never tell a hillbilly no. But you never tell a redneck Christian Baptist you can't do something. So we said, we know what we'll do. We'll get as far as the parking lot. 
we'll let Bobby stand on the porch and he can preach from the from the from the porch and we'll set up all kinds of little speakers and, and this, that, and other, and we'll put it out on the radio and you can sit in yonder, but may I remind you, and you know it just as well as I do, that worshiping God from the front seat of your car or pickup truck ain't near as good as worshiping God from a church pew on the inside of a sanctuary that says Mountain View Independent Baptist Church in great big box car letters on the front of this church because on the outside is nothing more than an invitation to something greater on the inside. Here's what I'm trying to tell you is that God said, don't you worry about it. Don't you ever bow before wicked man. Don't you bow before government that says you can't. May I remind you that Biden and that crew, they never wrote one word in this blessed book. It was written by the hand of Almighty God. And God said there'll never be a time where it's too dangerous to come into my house and to worship me. And David was a a man of war. David fought a lot of battles and he said, you know why I fight everything? So that I've got opportunity to go into God's house and worship God as I am led. Why do you think that men and women for hundreds of years have went to the battlefield and fought? It was to the right that you and I could go into God's house and worship the one true and holy God. Amen. David was a man of war and he said, I fought for the right to go to God's house and worship. Every man and woman since this nation has been a nation has put on a uniform and fought the fight against the enemy that says you can't, you can't, you can't because we've got a God that sits on the right hand of the Father and says you can, you can, you can and David said I know that I've been on the battlefield of the Malachites and the Philistines and everybody else and he said but the one thing they did not take away from me and they did not take away from Israel and they did not take away from the Jew is the fact is when God's house is open I'm I'm going to be through that door. I'll tell you what we need. We need somebody one more time to tell us just one more time. You can't go into God's house. We fill this place up because a hillbilly redneck Baptist ain't going to be told they can't worship God. And I know what I'm talking about because I are one. The Apostle Paul was a hillbilly too because he's the only one of the apostles that used the word I reckon in the word of God. <laughs> they may not know what it means in New York City, but right here in the middle of Campbell County, we fall at Tennessee. Every time I say I reckon, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. You see, the church will not bow. Have you noticed in one of the biggest conversations in our Baptist churches is because you've done it. Pretty sure I've done it too because if you've done something, I've probably done the same thing. We'll drive on our way to church or on the way home out to eat or out to the way back home after church meeting and you will will eyeball every church that you see on your way home, will you not? You'll look at the cars and you'll count about how many they are and this church is doing good and this church has got a parking lot full and this church ain't got but seven cars in it and people look at how many cars are in the parking lot to try to determine what's going on on the inside of that church and we determine this church is doing good and this church ain't doing so good and this church has got a big got a big uh, tur- out turning to the church that morning and that church didn't and God knows that we're all struggling uh, ever single church is trying to get people to come back to the house of God but you understand something there's coming a day when people who don't even go to church that would drive by and see a parking lot with a dozen cars in it and other churches got parking lot with full cars but what this world has not seen is that God's church family one day according to Revelation chapter number 19 it's when God splits those skies open he looks up behind him he's got his war clothes on he's tired of this devil running this place he's about to throw the antichrist into the lake of fire he's about to put the devil in handcuffs and chains it's when this world is about to see something they've never seen before if you think a dozen cars in the parking lot of a Baptist church is something you just wait till we mount up on white horses and have the white robes and God brings everybody that's been saved by his amazing grace and he just says let's go let's show them what a church is let's show 
show them what a church family is. Let's show them who we really are. And thank God we follow behind him and run white horses and we ride through the valley of Megiddo and God sets his church up. He sets his kingdom up and now they're about to find out how many people love God. David said, I was glad because he knew what it was like to march after a great victory and march in on the battlefield and march in great victory with the spoils of war. But this world ain't never seen a march until they seen millions of born again Christians riding white horses and God with flames of fire and God with the sword and God with the, on his sides and his vestures, King of kings and Lord of lords. They ain't no mistaking on who it is. He's the one that's leading everybody. And thank God as far as you could see for hundreds of miles ain't nothing but his church that's following him and they're about to see what a church family looks like amen we won't be divided into a dozen here and seven over there and a hundred on the other side it's millions of us that'll be here you see David said I was glad when they said let's go into the house of the Lord let them try to count millions of us on horseback because your greatest thoroughbreds at at the Kentucky Derby ain't never seen horses like this. They're horses of fire. Elijah had them in his day, and Elisha had them. And and you don't see them, but thank God heaven is full of them, and we'll be riding them white horses, and the world won't know what hit them. They'll be astounded. You see, if they think there's just a handful of us, if they think there's just a few of us, they get get just a little arrogant. They get to thinking there's more of them than they are of us. But you wait till we show up in one place at one time, and the TV cameras from around the world, they ain't never filmed nothing like this before. The greatest army. Me. and the Antichrist army is coming against Israel and he's gathered millions of them over 200 million men but thank God when God's army shows up and he just wipes them out and the blood runs up to the horses bridles then they're going to know how many people in this world that they said could not go into the house of God may I remind you we can't be stopped we can't be shut down we can't go quit on us it's thank God they couldn't stop it then and they'll not stop it now I was glad when they said let's go to the house of the Lord and it ain't just because I'm your preacher and I'm supposed to be here even if I wasn't I'd still be glad when they said let's go to the house of the Lord let me get to a few things here yet I'll never get this message preached today it's what we see when we see in the parking lot and the building and the blessings Have you ever thought about one of the first things you see when you drive on the church lot? You're going to see that big old brick building. I'm going to tell you something else you're going to see that you didn't get to see before. Do you see all them brand spanking new pretty white lines painted? First thing I want to say about that, you can tell the ones I painted and the ones Jerry painted. Jerry strays the gun barrel. Me, not so much. They wiggle. They're about like that road between here and Jellico. I've got a few curves, but it, you get the general idea. But you're going to see what is on the outside does not even compare to what is on the inside. On the outside is an invitation. On the outside tells the world who we are and where we're at. This is a church. There's no denying it. We've got a steeple. We've got a sign that says Mountain View Independent Baptist Church. We've got a parking lot to park your cars in. We've got a place outside that tells the lost and the saved exactly what this building is all about. But it's not where the, the it's not the, all that that takes place on the outside. It's what takes place on the inside. Amen. And here's what I want to get to. You see, we got the parking lot, we got the building, but what about the preaching? What does the Bible say? How can they hear except there's a preacher that'll preach the Word? And how can that preacher preach except he has been sent? And thank God that God still calls preachers to preach the gospel of of, of the Lord. And thank God that there's preaching. Thank God it's not when you get here, you're not going to get entertainment. You're not going to get some big act that's coming in. You're not going to get some outreach thing. 
You're not going to get some promotional whatever. You're not going to get some, something that's just made to just draw people in to entertain you. Thank God when you get to the house of Almighty God, you're going to get preaching right straight out of this Bible, right straight out of the Word of Almighty God. It's going to be thus saith the Lord. It'll be the whole counsel of God. It'll be without compromise. It'll be whatever God said. Sometimes you'll get offended. Sometimes you'll get glad about it. But bless God, you're going to get straight preaching, straight out of that Word of God, just like it was 200 years ago. Just what the church is built on. What this country was founded on. What thus saith the God. And not some big name order that's just going to tickle your ears with the way that He speaks. Bless God, I'm as ignorant as I can be. But I know one thing. I will preach that precious book. Amen. You got to know what you're going to get when you get in here. Preaching. It's always got the job done. It ain't what some author wrote of a book. Well, we need to get this fellow. He's got 16 books. Won't you get the guy that just preaches the 66 books God wrote? Not only are you going to get preaching, but you're going, you're going to get singing. Let me tell you something, church. I don't care what number one hits out there on the radio. I don't care what genre that they're singing from. I don't care how famous they are, what kind of voice they got, what type of music it's going to be. You'll never have singing in your life. That just goes straight in and blesses your soul like good church singing. It's whether it's the choir. Have you ever noticed that God gets a hold of that choir from time to time? And it's no, it's not just voices singing together, but it's God singing through them. It's God anointing them from the inside out. It's God building a song on the inside of everyone that lifts their voice and they're singing about a Savior because if you understand where you're from and where God brought you from and where God has brought you to, if you'll recognize on where you could have been, if you'll recognize that one day you were on your way to hell, but thank God God met you one day and now you know you're on your way to heaven and that same God that saved you that went to the cross is the God that walks with you every day and now you've got something worth singing about it's not what God did for somebody else it's what God did for you amen and when you ever get a hold of what God did for you you'll sing about it amen Woo, glory you see you'll get singing in here that'll just bless your soul from one end to the other you don't have to have a top one. You don't have to have a top ten. You don't have to have a top twenty. You don't have to have a record label. You don't have to be signed to nothing. It don't take a contract. All it takes is the one that's been born again, just knowing, just looking up and saying, God, I'm just going to lift my voice and I'm just going to do it in praise. There's one thing about singing for talent and singing to sell albums, but bless God when you're singing that you're glorifying the one that paid that price for you, that, to, that met you where you were, and forgave you of every sin that you ever have and has walked with you and has blessed you and has watched over you and He made it well, He made it uh, you able that you could be in God's house this morning. Amen. You are to thank Him with everything that's in you. But thank God that he, if you ain't called to preach, you, but as God ain't it good to know. You still got a song in your heart. And I know that there are folks in this church that have a talent for singing and some that stand out as spe special singing and some just sing in the choir but may God I remind you this morning that everybody that opens their mouth and lifts their voice is singing because you've met the Savior because you've saved because you've been blessed because you've got something to sing about amen, amen. may I remind you that Jesus is an equal opportunity employer you may not be good enough to be on American Idol you may not be good at four chair turn as a voice you may not have a record label you may not have a song on the radio but thank God what you've got on the inside of you is way better than anything there'll be a different American Idol next year there'll be a new number one on some radio station but may I remind you this morning is that bless God you always singing for that number one and its name is Jesus amen you'll always have a song to sing and you'll always have a savior that wants to hear you sing it to him 
because the angels, they don't have anything to sing about. The lost, they don't have anything worth singing about. But thank God there's a song that God creates on the inside of every born again believer. That how He has blessed you and how He's done things for you and how He has brought you through and how if it wasn't for Him, you never would have made it. That creates an urge inside of you. That song begins to form. It may have been written by somebody else, but it's special because it's coming from your heart. It's going out your lips and God is just looking up into heaven and He's telling the angels always, I know you don't know nothing about it but I was there when they got saved because I saved them when I went to the cross they were on my mind before I formed them in their mother's womb I knew one day they'd sing a song that was dedicated just to me I believe heaven rejoices more when God's people come together and start to worship and praise and rejoice thank God for a song on somebody's heart this morning so David said, I was glad because David knew what it was like when others had, had their, their spirits that, that, that were troubled. And there's something about God would give David a song that he would write and sing on that harp and he'd play for him. And that songs of praise that he would say would quiet them down and it would calm them. I don't know what kind of condition you were spiritually. I don't know what kind of condition that you were uh, physically in this morning. But I do know one thing. That when God's people begin to lift their voices and sing praises to Almighty God, you have to feel a whole lot better. He may not fix you at one visit but he'll make you feel better about being here and suddenly that 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 burden that you've got it's not as heavy as it was when you first got here at th- that storm it's not raging as bad as it once was and I'm telling you church if anybody ever needed to go and found out when they got to the house of God they had forgiveness it was David You see, you understand we've got preaching, we've got singing, but have you ever thought about something else that God offers to make you glad to go into God's house? He's got testimonies. Oh, what's that mean? That means that somewhere in your life you were facing a storm, climbing a mountain, found yourself in a valley, found yourself surrounded by an enemy, and your enemy comes in many different forms. And the only reason that you have a testimony that's burning in your heart that you've got to share with someone else is because it was God that went in that valley with you. It was God that stilled the storm in your in your life. It was God that took something back together that the devil and the world tried to take from you. It was God that that blessed you in a way that you can't contain it anymore. You've heard what the Bible says, that sometimes the cup runs over. That's what a testimony is. That means you've rejoiced on the inside. You've been thanking God, but there's so much for you to thank God about. You can't keep it to yourself anymore. How many times have we heard it in this church right here? And the fact is, I can't keep quiet. God kept telling me to testify. God kept telling me to share with you what He's done. And it got so great that you could your cup began to spill over and thank God you'd have you've got something that you need to share with somebody else a testimony is when God the Savior has blessed you to the place you can't keep it to yourself anymore don't you just love testimonies when God's blessed someone and it's just about to boil over but not only that but there's more that'll make you glad to come into God's house Oh, it's wonderful to have a parking lot. Have you thought about that you drove whatever it is you drove and you didn't have to ride a team of mules in a wagon? People used to come to God's house that way. Oh, it's good to have a beautiful building in a parking lot with new white stripes all over it. It's good to have the church's names in big old letters up on the front. On the It's good to have a beautiful building in all these pews. It's great to have a pulpit to preach out of. It is wonderful to have a choir loft to sing the praises of God. But let me tell you the most important part of this church right here. You see, everybody gets in on the singing, do they not? Even pay, hey, listen, let me tell you, I have caught people that will not sing in the choir, will not special sing. I've seen your lips move. You're lip syncing. And you're doing that because you don't trust yourself to sing out loud, but there's something stirring in your heart that you're singing on the inside, and your lips are moving. Amen. And you think, I'm just looking around not noticing nothing. I'm noticing stuff. 
That means God is blessing you, and what you do won't do out loud, you're having one more great time inside your own self. But that, that singing is just for everybody. The preaching, I'm doing the preaching, but everybody gets in on it. But may I remind you of this. This altar is an individual altar. Now we're going to gather around you and pray with you. You're not going to have to go to the altar yourself. But we're going to gather around. We're going to pray with you and put our hands upon your back and pray and say, God, we're hedging them about. And devil, you better leave them alone because you've got the entire church family to go through to get to them. We're going to help carry that burden. What I'm telling you is this. is the most important function, the most important part of any church. Is The fact is when you get here, whatever burden you carried around for that last week, that month, that last year, maybe it's a lifetime. Maybe you're living your burden on a daily life. Maybe there's something going on and you find yourself in an environment that you can't get yourself out of and it's like living in the worst storm and going through the darkest valley and fighting the worst battle and you know that when you leave this house of God it's probably going to be there because it was there when you left but what I am trying to tell you is this is whatever it is that you carried in with you whatever somebody else put in your life that you didn't ask for whatever it is that's dr- that has dragged you down and trying to steal the joy out of your life there is a place set aside that you can leave it that's when every individual based on your individual needs and based on your faith that you can come to this precious altar right here and that you can ask God to forgive you you don't have to carry sin around with you may I remind you this morning if there ever was even one man in the Bible that needed to know that there was an altar that he could pray to it was King David was it not how many times did he write created me a new heart a new heart oh Lord how had how many times did he write don't withdraw your presence from me how many times the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart how many times was it that David came in and he needed one place that he knew that it wasn't judgment but thank God he was seeking forgiveness how would you like to be the man that took another man's wife away from him how would you like to be the man that caused another man's death to cover up his own sin how would you like to be that man that repented in his heart and what he wanted he already had judgment but what he needed above all things was the place that he can find forgiveness how many in this church knows that whatever you've done God already knows about it God's already nailed it to the cross God's already forgiven it what you need is one place in your life that you can go to no matter what it is you've done and find forgiveness amen Woo! You've got to find out there's enough out there to judge you. You've got the law that'll judge you based on what law you broke. You've got a Bible that will judge you based on what you did wrong. You've got a God that not only can set in judgment, but... He is a God that can forgive you of whatever you did. And if you ever going to find peace, because you cannot have joy until you have peace. And until you have peace, you cannot have gladness. What I'm telling you is this. Don't never, never, never come into God's house thinking that you've got a God that has a switch and He's waiting on you to show up so He can beat you with it without mercy. You have a God that stands right here, that's done looked inside your heart, that knows what you've done, that knows what you're going through, that knows how it's stealing your joy. And that God has got those nail-scarred hands and He's waiting on you to come to this altar to give you forgiveness. Because you understand you have a God that was tempted on every hand just like you and I are. You have a God that's went through every emotion that you and I go through. But you have a God who's the only one in this entire universe that can offer forgiveness for what you're carrying with you. But what about everybody else? Can I just tell you about everybody else? Everybody else is going to have an opinion. Everybody else is going to talk about it. Everybody else is going to assume something. And I'm just telling you the truth. It don't matter if it's the people you work with or the people in church or the people at other churches. They're going to talk. But you go to the one that says, I ain't here to, to, I ain't here to whisper. I'm here to forgive you of what you've done. And the truth of it is, if God forgave you, it don't matter what anybody else thinks about it anyway. 
If I had one of them magic buttons, there ain't nothing magic in church. I won't say that first and foremost, but if I had that one button, And it could, and I had the ability to do what God did to John the Baptist's daddy. You remember me preaching on that? He shut him up until John was born, and he wrote, "His name shall be called John." I could push that button, and I could shut everybody's mouth that's gossiping about somebody else. That got head nods and two or three amens. I would shut your mouth until you promised that you'd never gossip again. Does it go on in God's house? Yeah. Does it go on in this church? Yes. Does it go on out yonder? Yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You better start amen to me. Because if I tell the truth, it don't matter if it's popular or not. That's an amen, is it not? Amen. All right, then. Don't get too loud with the amens or else I'll think it's you. <laughs> I'm just doing this because I need to catch my breath for a minute. You need, to free, you need an altar because an altar puts you on holy ground in the church. Amen. Moses had an entire desert, but the only place that was holy in that entire desert was the place he was standing, and it was only because God's presence was where he was standing. May I remind you that when you come to the altar, you definitely want the presence of God. And where the presence of God is, that simply means that God's presence is there and it has now become holy. And whatever it is that you carried in, that you need God to take off of you so that you can, let, you can enjoy your salvation, is the fact of it is if God's presence is there, it is going to work. I've preached this so many times so one more can't hurt nothing. I still preach the God of this Bible. I still preach the God that heals illnesses. That God can still raise the dead when the doctor says it's too late. I preach the God God, that still saves the lost. I preach a God that forgives all manner of sins. I preach a God that no matter if everybody you know has turned their back upon you and pointed at you and pointed at your sins, He's the God that will ride in the dirt and say forgiven when everybody else wants to cast a stone. Thank God He writes down. He's been forgiven and God looks around and says where are thine accusers? And they ain't nowhere to be seen. I don't accuse you. I forgive you. Thank God you come in the church accused but you leave forgiven that'll make you glad to come to God's house won't it I ain't looked at my watch is anybody getting hungry yet because I kind of listen for the right when I take a breath I listen if I can hear any rumblings I think we're still good I want to know when I go to church I'm glad because it's a place I will be forgiven David needed forgiveness what about the Apostle Peter? Was he not the only apostle that denied Jesus three different times? Ain't it the truth? And God made sure he put that in his Bible. Now that's not what a preacher wants on his resume. We're going to get the Apostle Peter next week and let me see what it is. Yep, he's walked on water. He's the only apostle to ever raise the dead. He's the only apostle that denied Jesus three times. That would get you canceled out today, would it not? Because you ever understood that, there, that churches and preachers want to hold somebody else to a whole lot higher accountability than they do their own self? You better have everything right or you're going to preach at my church. Well, may I remind you that the people that Jesus called to do his preaching were tax collectors, fishermen, adulterers, sinners, murderers. And God chose them who knows everything. I don't know about you, but as a preacher and a pastor, kind of gets it kind of gets to me when you become Levitical Baptist. You want to hold everybody else accountable to the full extent of God's law and then some. Knowing the whole time about how your life is. Amen. Amen. I've told you different times, there ain't no halos in this church. We're just all sinners saved by God's amazing grace. 
and the gospel, whether I preach it or anybody else, I preach the same no matter who you are in this church. Amen. It's the same truth. I got two head nods and a really low O oh, amen right here. Just keep working on it, church. You'll get there. All right, let me preach on. You see, the Apostle Paul, I ain't going to be preaching on him. I'm going to move on ahead. I want to tell you something else that makes you glad to come into God's house. Because this is the only place in the entire world, whether it be this church or any other church, that's the New Testament church that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Savior and the head of it. Is the fact is that this is the church, this is the only place that you'll go where you'll find all three crosses. Oh, well, that, huh? That's got some amens. You ain't sure what you're amening, but you're going with me on it, and I like that. But we only have the one cross. Oh, we got two more here. You don't see them. And I ain't talking about the one in the kitchen. I'm talking about we recognize right off the bat that one in the middle because that's the Lord Jesus Christ, is it not? But may I remind you of something that you on Golgotha that day, did you not have two thieves being crucified the same day Jesus was? Did he not have a male factor on one side and on the other side? Did I not, may I also remind you this morning, is that those men were going to die that day and nothing could get them out of it. And they got that day and they both had opportunity. But there was no forgiveness on Golgotha until that third cross went in the ground. And when that third cross went in the ground, dear friend, the fact it wasn't the cross in the ground, it was who was hanging upon that cross. He was dying for the sins of this world. He was dying for the sins of our church. He was dying for the sins going back to the Garden of Eden. And thank God He was there. And on one side, on the other, did they one not say, you, 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 Forgive. why don't you just forgive why don't you get yourself off the cross and the other thief said we deserve to be here and I'm just filling these in because I've got a lot of preaching doing I've got to hurry up and get there and you see that you had those two men that one was hanging on the cross the other was hanging on the cross both of them were guilty and that one buddy he had repentance in his heart he just looked at Jesus and he said I, he said whenever you come into your kingdom he said would you please remember me and Jesus said this day thou shalt be in in, in paradise with me did he not say that what I'm trying to tell you is this is that we're all hung upon a cross of our sins and our past and our un unforgiveness but thank God they've always got that one that's on that third cross that's in the middle amen who's a cross that's paying for my sin debt and paying for your sin debt you'll have people come into this church that's like the thief on the cross it's remember me when you come into thy kingdom but you'll also have these hanging on the other cross that said I don't want none of it they just don't even worry with it I'm guilty of what I've done I don't want to be saved I don't want to believe in him and they'll leave this under conviction this church and die and go to hell Amen. you see all three crosses are represented he ain't on that cross anymore he's already paid to send that but that's a remembrance of knowing that every time you come into this church, the Savior that we serve, that we, re that we rejoice about, the one that we praise, the one that we worship, He hung upon that cross so that we would have forgiveness when we come into the house of God. If that don't make you glad, church, I don't know what's going to make you glad. But to know that you were once hanging on a cross on your way to hell, you were guilty as guilty could be, you had no chance before God came and before He paid that sin dead you had no way of getting your sins forgiveness you never had you'd never enter into heaven but thank God on Golgotha that day and what happened on Golgotha happens every week in this church is that somebody needs something from God somebody needs to be forgiven somebody needs to be saved somebody needs something else and God thank God because of that third cross that man in the middle you can get what you need and you'll get it at the house of Almighty God because God is the man on that middle cross. That'll make you glad coming into God's house. Let me finish up. I know I, have, I don't know what time it is, but I know I'm tired. Church represents the three crosses, but the church is your. Let me tell you something. The church is your Samaritan's well. What am I even talking about? You remember that time Jesus made a trip to Samaria? Woman at the well. There we go. Do you know she said, you're a Jew. 
What are you talking about? Me draw you some water? Why are you even talking to me? Because nobody ever cared about her enough, not even in Samaria, to be her friend. Nobody cared enough about her to come four days' journey just to give her an opportunity for salvation. All they did was talk about her. She was at the well in the middle of the heat of the day because nobody else would be seen with her in town because she had a reputation. She'd had five husbands and now she had a boyfriend. She wasn't, she doesn't give up on marriage. She threw her life away by decisions that she made. And it ain't all just her. That woman was used by a bunch of men. You don't talk about that, but yeah, men can be some sorry people. There we go. Any daddy that's ever raised a daughter, you know what sorry boyfriends are. I got so mad one time I found one of her old boyfriends. I don't know if I were to tell this or not. It's going on Facebook. I don't know how long the statutes of limitations is, but (laughs) let me just give you the Reader's Digest version of it. I wasn't there to pray. I throwed him up against the wall, and I spoke clear English. I was 160 pounds of one mad daddy. Never had a problem anymore. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. If you think a daddy that loves his daughter ain't, gotten, ain't going to put up with somebody doing his daughter wrong, may I remind you that Jesus was there as her Savior. Don't you suppose that it made Jesus angry at the way she was being treated? Do you want people to treat you according to the mistakes you've made in your past? Do you want people to get make of, of things that you've done? Do you want to go through life and people look at you based on a reputation that has been formed by decisions you've made your own self or what everybody else applies to you? Jesus showed up that day to put a stop to the way because that had become his, she was about to become his father's daughter. Are you with me? And the fact of it is, is that if anybody's ever going to, if anybody, if that woman's ever going to be his father's daughter, which makes her his sister, he's going to go in there and he's going to take care of business. And when you find out that she was at that well with the reputation, he gave her the forgiveness because she went from having a reputation as a woman at the well that had been married five times and now had a boyfriend that she wasn't even married to. And the fact is that God gave her a testimony. She went to that town. She didn't care what the people said. She didn't care what they thought. She didn't care what their opinions was. She was telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. What I am saying to you is this, is that I don't know your life, but if God has ever saved you from a past, that has to find who people say that you are. And God has given you a testimony and not a past. Thank God you are to shout the victory to God. It don't matter what it used to be. It don't matter what it once was. What matters now is that you got a Savior that saved you from what you used to be and so you'll find Wednesday night let's don't even wait till Wednesday we got church on Sunday nights 6 o'clock when it's time to open these doors and it's time to start man everybody that walks through these doors ought to be glad you're not on your way to hell today You've been forgiven of the wrongs that you have purposely done, and you know that. No matter what everybody has said, if you ever raised, if you was ever raised up in any kind of school or raised up in any community where you've been poor, and people judged you based on the house you lived in, the car your daddy drove, the clothes you wore, and the work you worked, and, and, and they still do that today. Am I telling the truth? And the fact of it is, is that God said it ain't about what you wear. It ain't about where you've been. It ain't about what everybody else says. I want you to understand that no matter how poor you grew up, how much or how little that you have right now, you are a child of the Most High God. You are royalty in this world. And the fact of it is, you're going to live in a mansion up in heaven. You're going to wear white robes. You're going to walk on streets of gold. Your Father is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. What I'm trying to tell you this morning, 
important is this. It ain't based on what everybody else says. It ain't how you grew up. It ain't where you grew up. Ain't God, it's that vow that you've been got a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. If that don't make you shout hallelujah, I ain't got no idea what's going to. Would y'all come get a verse invitation? I'm going to quit right here. Amen. Melinda, you might want to come up and get and get a song this morning. Would you ask yourself a question? Because this is a time where you do business with God. You've done, been sung to, you've been preached to this morning. Are you glad when it's time to go to the house of God? Are you glad that you've been to the house of God? Are you glad that you've got a Savior that made you a place to go where it's not who, what everybody else says you are, but it's who He says you are? While we stand our feet. Altars open if you want to pray. I want to see people happy and smiling and be glad. Just as I am. That's how God found you. That's how God saved you. I want to ask you a question. I know this happens in school a lot, but it happens in the grown up world too. People have so bullied you and talked about you and painted you in a corner that you've lost the joy. You may be here, and your circumstances of where you are has taken the joy from you. You want it back. God's got it for you. Yes, God bless them as they pray. Amen. Touch them as they pray. Anybody else? Yeah, just come right on ahead. Turn it over to the Lord. God touch them as they pray. Yes, as they make their way to the altar. No matter what it is, bring it to the Lord. God touch them as they pray. Anybody else? Altar's open. If you're here this morning and you know somebody that's going through a really hard time, would you come pray for them? It don't always have to be you. Would you lift their name up to the Lord this morning? Yes, God touch them this morning as they pray.
Amen. <coughs> okay. Does anybody got anything on their mind or heart before we dismiss? Amen. 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 Anybody else? Let me tell you something. When you come to God's house, you're God's family. You're somebody. You may never be in the eyes of others down here on earth, but they don't matter anyway. Anybody else? All right. As far as I know, ain't nothing going on this evening, is there? Oh, uh, duh. yeah, it just now, not this evening, but after church, can the ladies have a 10-minute meeting? Is that not what I was told? 10 minutes. Sign a paper. We need some co-signers. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, before we get the youngins up here, Danny, would you dismiss us in prayer, and then I'm going to call for the youngins, and then there'll be a women's meeting. Come on.